don't know what an Oyster card is, have a look at this video on the front of the website and it'll tell you actually how you can use it. You'll see in a moment uh, somebody actually going through the barrier and then actually swiping it. So this is the kind of data, there's the Oyster card going in, swipe in, that's the kind of data. Now I'll just uh, point you in that direction uh, so you can look at this, a variety of people including myself uh, talking about that. And then what I want to do is I'm going to move out of that and go to the, uh, to the PowerPoint basically um, and um, I'll, I'll then, I'll now talk really about the project itself. So we're really looking in this context at uh, these network systems in, uh, in, in Greater London and we're looking at this general question of disruption. Now this is a very early project and I'm going to show you three aspects of it which relate to data and how we're handling it uh, with respect to uh, this general question of disruption. Okay, let me say a few things about the context. One of the things about flows in urban areas, flows on networks, is that generally speaking most of our emphasis on looking at flows in <coughs> urban areas tend to be on single mode systems. By mode, um, again this is a fairly, uh, fairly general English word, we actually mean uh, mode of transport basically, so particularly transportation modelling uh, deals largely with the private car, uh, largely because it was developed uh, transportation modelling about 50 years ago, it began to be, be developed in North America. So there's a strong emphasis on, on the private car and occasionally in transport modelling they deal with single modes. But the competition between modes is very problematic and of course each mode uses a slightly different network. So there has been a strong bias uh, in thinking about flows in cities uh, related to single mode systems. In the context of the Oyster card, then by its very nature, uh, where you're giving somebody um, a swipe card like this, uh, and uh, where you have a number of modes being controlled by one operator, then clearly we're dealing with multimodal na nature in this particular context. And the other feature, of course, is the single modal uh, emphasis on flows is analytically a bit more tractable than dealing with modes that compete, for example, in that context. Now, we've, as I said to you, we have a very large data set uh, from Transport for London, from our public uh, uh, transport network there, a large behavioural data set, um, and, and uh, th this particular data set that we have has great spatial resolution because obviously the resolution depends on uh, where you actually use the card in terms of entering the system. So if you're on a bus, for example, uh, then we know all the locations of the bus stops in terms of X, Y coordinates. So when you get onto a bus, we know where you've entered. Clearly, uh, in the case of the stations, um, with respect to the tube system and the overground, that, then we have the detailed spatial resolution in that particular context. We've got great temporal resolution because the data set um, is available at the particular instant of a particular uh, traveller swiping in and out. So if I swipe in, uh, it'll tell me where I swipe in, where I swipe out. It'll tell me uh, exactly um, at what point in the day, uh, down to seconds basically, when this actually happens. And I have a unique identifier uh, on my Oyster card, uh, which enables me to actually search the data set to find out if I'm actually travelling anywhere else on the Oyster card uh, during the day. So in principle, we can extract commuters from this on the assumption that the commuter actually enters early in the day somewhere, um, leaves at some particular point, and then enters again within some radius of that particular point where they might be working uh, in the evening peak. So in principle, we can actually identify or we can actually detect in this sense, uh, we, can, we can engage in sort of making uh, plausible assumptions uh, about how people are behaving in that sense and therefore begin to identify different kinds of, uh, of travellers. Now the data set is highly protected. All we get is um, uh, essentially uh, an, an ID. Uh, we don't know who it is. Um, we only know it's a traveller. Uh, there is some distinction in the data set between different types of travellers. For example, it's probably no secret to you that I'm greater than 60 years old, so consequently I get a free travel costs. Now in, in England, uh, in Britain, we call them, we used to call them free bus passes, right, basically pensioners get free bus passes. So everybody over 60 gets a free bus pass or, or a free Oyster card in this particular context and that's identified. So if I use the system, they know that I'm over 60, basically. Um, a child, for example, paying a, 
uh, affair would also be identified. And there are various special categories, for example, veterans and so on, people like that, who get these. So that's actually identified. But there's nothing about my socioeconomic profile. There's nothing about where I actually live or work in that context. All it is is it's giving me the actual, uh, it's actually the data is giving us the actual swipe in and swipe out. Now, this is a great data set. We've got six months of data, and there's at least a billion records in this particular context. That means that uh, we're, we're, we've got uh, data over a six-month period. It's roughly about five or six million swipe in and swipe out a day. London uh, is, uh, the London that we're looking at in this context is about seven to eight million people. Uh, there's about two million people who work in the central business district. That's the city, the West End, or, or, or the government quarter. So that's a very big concentration. It's a highly monocentric city, we would say, in our terms in that context. So uh, in some senses, it's a very big data set in this particular context. Um, however, there are lots of problems with the data sets. Great data in terms of telling us what's happening over space and time, uh, but it's problematic for lots of human reasons. The data set is brilliant. Well, the, the, the November uh, in 2010, the Monday that I actually looked at, um, 6.2 million people swiped in and 5.4 million people swiped out over 24 hours. So where did the missing 8 million, 0.8 of a million go? They're not still in the tube system rattling around in the middle of the night. Uh, but what happens is the porters, the operators, leave the barriers up, basically. Now, of course, if you're on the system and you're a regular sort of uh, a traveler paying the, paying the, paying the fare, etc., then you get fined if you don't swipe, uh, swipe in and swipe out. They take the maximum fare, basically. Uh, in a sense, because the system's divided into zones first. However, there's a very large number of free travelers, like myself, for example, and I don't really have to swipe in or out, basically, in that context, because the card works anywhere. So, in other words, we're actually, we've got real problems of identification at that level. There are lots of problems of that sort. Uh, for example, we did detect at one point somebody with a certain identifier got on a bus in Hammersmith, and at the same time also got on a tube in the city, right? the same, like, the same person. And so there are some gl glitches in the system. Transport for London have not found it very easy to account for these, for, for these things that we're actually finding. So the data set is by no means perfect, but it is interesting in this particular context. Okay, now um, privacy issues are very well protected in this context because essentially the traveller is invisible uh, apart from the swipe in and swipe out locations in that context. And what we're actually doing is we're looking at this data set uh, in a number of different ways. Um, and uh, here, here's a simple slide that tells you a little bit about uh, uh, approaches in this particular context. Uh, we, we, do, we, we will introduce, I'll introduce in a moment, a fairly straightforward graph theoretical view of the network without thinking about the travellers because a lot of disruption in networks really relates to the topology of the network and when you get some kind of change in the topology, for example a line breaks down in that sense or a hub or a node disappears and there's quite a lot of work really uh, in the graph theoretical, the network science literature. So here are some recent, uh, uh, a couple of recent papers von Ferber, Derrible, I haven't actually read the ERAF paper but uh, uh, the two papers at the top there I've read, and they, they are essentially looking at the network and what happens to the accessibility or the centrality in network science, they call it, uh, the index uh, of, of different uh, lines and uh, different uh, nodes and arcs, etc. in the network. What happens to those is if you get one of these breakages, one of these disruptions. Then, of course, there are the agent-based models. In the project that I'm involved with, with Maxi, for example, we're using the, the MATSIM model. This is a fully-fledged... Um, transportation model uh, where each individual traveler is looked at in terms of their daily uh, travel profile etc uh, those models take a lot of uh, uh, a lot of data you need travel and so in some sense they're at the other extreme from the graph theoretic models in this particular context so what I'm going to do is to introduce a couple of examples uh, two or three examples uh, of where we're sort of in the middle ground in terms of thinking about disruption okay so why London? Now I've said several, I've said several things about this already, uh, that the heart of this project is the Oyster card data, uh, but let me actually say something a little bit more detail. Of these 6 million swipe in and swipe outs, then there are about 3 million daily users, because if you're swiping in and swiping out, if you're a commuter, uh, then basically, 
or rather, if you're, if you're actually going somewhere, then you're likely to return, even if you're a shopper in that sense. So uh, roughly, if we divide our 6 million swipe in, swipe outs by 2, we get 3 million daily users. So this is the order of magnitude. Now, in the system, we've got 640 stations. Uh, those are locations. And um, uh, these are some characteristics of them. 340 of the stations of the 640 are served by national rail. Uh, in some sense. So the national rail system is intersecting with the overground and the underground. I'll come to this distinction in a moment show you a picture. Uh, we've got 80 stations served by the overground, which is kind of like, uh, it's like the underground. It's been adopted uh, comparatively recently by, um, uh, 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 by uh, Transport for London. It was traditionally part of national rail. Uh, but it's really, um, it's not really suburban rail, that's still national rail, but uh, uh, it's, it's old railway lines that interface with the tube system quite well. Uh, there's 80 stations on the overground. There's 270 stations which are served by the underground itself. 45 stations served by the Docklands Light Railway, uh, which is um, largely overground, uh, which was built to link the City of London to the Docklands, which developed as London's second central business district. Uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, 39 stations are served by tram. There's a couple of trams in London. And 147 of these stations are some kind of interchange between line or mode. So there's not a lot of stations. Uh, the ma vast majority of stations don't have interchanges uh, with other lines or other modes in this context. We've actually, uh, in some sense, related this to a street map uh, uh, it's a map of the network of the streets, basically, uh, which we use to look at the relationships between uh, the, <coughs> the tube and the overground stations with respect to how people might walk between stations. We've used a, a crowdsourced map, which is OpenStreetMap, uh, which incidentally was um, I'm very proud of the fact that OpenStreetMap originated in uh, uh, University College. Uh, basically originally in, in, in UCL. So OpenStreetMap is a crowdsourced map which actually uh, has become extremely valuable uh, in the sense that it's essentially free and it doesn't break any kind of copyright. How does the bus system integrate? Uh, the bus system with the, uh, with, with, with the Oyster card. Okay, so now the bus system uh, is, uh, uh, the bus system you can use the Oyster card as you enter the bus, right? Most of our buses in fact, I think probably all our buses now in London are just driver buses. There's no conductors, basically. Of course, you don't swipe out on a bus. So what we're looking at uh, this afternoon is basically the swipe in, swipe out. So we've got some measure of closure. On a bus, we don't actually swipe out. You just get onto the bus, swipe in, and um, so it records it. However, we are engaged in a project which is looking at what happens to a traveller who gets on a bus. If that traveller um, then gets onto another mode of transport, either a bus or a rail, a, a train, within a, certain, uh, within a certain time of being on the bus, we assume that it's a linked trip. So, for example, if somebody got on the bus at Tottenham Court Road and then got on a train half, within a certain window of time uh, at, say, Good Street, which is two stops, tube stops us up, up Tottenham Court Road, then if it was within half an hour, we'd say that was a, an integrated trip. We'd assume that the person had got no time to go to work. They may have shopped at this point. They might have bought a newspaper, might have had a coffee or something like that. So we'd assume that's an integrated trip. One of the advantages of the database <coughs> is that we can begin to make inferences about how people use the, the different mobile systems in that sense. But we've not done it, I'm not reporting any of that here because that's much more experimental uh, in, terms of, in terms of this data. Okay, now here's the system. Uh, let me just point out a few things that uh, the orange, in fact, is the overground and all of the, the orange line is the overground uh, and these, uh, these, these different colored lines which are color coded to <coughs> the lines that you actually see if you get on the underground so the circle line is traditionally the, the yellow line at this point. I should point out to those who uh, have been to London and know about the circle line, it's no longer a true circle. What they've actually done is they've extended it so that it's now a loop, basically. Uh, so in other words, you, you can uh, uh, the trains leaving Hammersmith go all the way uh, around the old circle line, all the way to Edgware Road, and then come back, as it were, 
in this particular context. It took them, um, it took them, I think, something like 70 years to work this out, and it was only instituted about two years ago. Uh, and it actually has improved the travel quite dramatically. Rather than the trains going around all the time, they just go around in this particular loop and then back again in that sense. So it has improved the, improved things quite dramatically in terms of uh, passenger movements. It's a bit frustrating because if you get into Paddington Station here, you have to walk a long way to get to the National Rail Station, whereas previously you could actually sort of if you get if you go to Paddington uh, on this line, on, on the other way around, in this sense, it's, it's a lot shorter to uh, buy a ticket for National Rail. So there are some downsides to this, but I'll come to that in a moment because one of the features is in thinking about how people use this system, uh, we really, really need to dig down into all the other kinds of things that go on in tube stations, such as people having to walk down long platforms and so on. Okay, so we have the circle line. So essentially, if I were to extract this, and we'll see some extracted diagrams, then essentially it's a tree system. It's a radial system. Uh, there's a loop at Heathrow, in a sense, in that context. But generally speaking, it's a tree system with this complicated uh, uh, set of uh, networks with the circle, basically, uh, and a number of cross routes linking stations actually in the center itself. And London Center uh, really is more or less contained within the circle line itself. This, uh, uh, this is actually Hyde Park, this is Regent's Park, this is the government quarter, uh, the West End, which is the shopping center, and then the city of London uh, out to Liverpool Street. So essentially the circle line contains a very large uh, central business district uh, in this particular context, which is uh, characteristic, I think, of the sort of business districts uh, or central, central areas of cities you get in, uh, in New York uh, and Tokyo and so on. There's nothing comparable to this. Uh, Paris is, is similar, of course, but there's nothing comparable to this anywhere else in, in Britain. The, the next set of cities is really a, a lower level in the hierarchy. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce three approaches. First of all, I'm not going to talk about uh, the, um, the Oyster card data. And then my second example will be more to do with the network. And then finally, I'll finish with the Oyster card data. But we've got three little projects that are not quite interfaced with each other yet, but hopefully will do, because they'll give us different insights on this question of, uh, of, of disruption. The first project we've got is um, a project where we're actually looking at the, not the flow of passengers, but the flow of trains. Transport for London have an API that enables you to query at any particular point where the location of a tube or a bus is. By a tube, I mean a train in this particular context. So in other words, if you um, uh, get access to this API, you can actually query it for the location of, say, a train or all trains on a particular line. So in other words, you've got a flow of data, a flow of data out of the API, uh, which enables you to get the position uh, and time of any particular train um, on the system over 24 hours. And the same for a bus. That's a very large data set. There's a latency of about three minutes between when you query the uh, data and when you actually get it to uh, your particular clients in that context. So uh, in that context, we have some very interesting data. And I'll show you a little movie of this in a moment uh, for, for this data. And from the tube trains, we can clearly work out things like, um, uh, things like uh, uh, whether there's delay on the system. Uh, and of course, this is largely because each tube train, uh, there is indeed, uh, you, one would perhaps not imagine this, but there is indeed a timetable. There's a, there's a desired uh, a time and position for a train uh, and indeed a bus in terms of the actual scheduling in that sense. So we can actually match the actual scheduling or the actual location and time of these particular trains and buses uh, against what the idealization is. And Richard Milton, one of my colleagues, is... Uh, is, is at work on this problem. And I'll show, I'll show you a little bit about uh, uh, what we're able to extract from this data set. I then want to move on to something which is a bit more traditional, um, a little bit more conventional, I should say, and this is the, uh, the classic graph theoretic measures of the network itself. So this is really all about the, the trains that are moving on the network and the buses. This is all about the network itself, really, this second thing, uh, uh, where we actually break the network and we look at how the accessibility, uh, and I'll talk about what that means in a moment. And then the last thing is really back to the Oyster card data, where we're really trying to look at 
uh, the actual flow of passengers as well as the network. So we're mixing graphs and flows, we're mixing networks and flows in that context. We're also adding in walks, etc. And this is the work that uh, my colleague John, uh, John Reed is doing. So all of this is, is reasonably preliminary. Okay, now this is, the, uh, this is the first problem. This is the flows on the tube lines by trains in this context. Uh, and this is a map basically showing you uh, at, at one particular instance of time. I can't quite read. Well, maybe I can quite. I can read what this is. This is, um, uh, this is on, the third, on the 20th of March, 2012 at uh, 14.39 in the afternoon, so 20 to 3, uh, and the, li the little box here is pointing to a train which is uh, between St. Paul's Tube Station and Chancery Lane. It's travelling westbound. Uh, it says that it's 30 seconds away from the station and the, 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 uh, the destination, so this is this train uh, roundabout here, the destination is West Ryslip, which is in West London here. So that's the nature of the data. And of course, if we compile this data, begin to look at it intelligently um, in terms of uh, speeds, etc., which we can work out and so on, match it against timetable, we say something reasonably sen sensible um, about the extent of the delay on the system. And of course, if there are breakdowns, then uh, clearly this, this, this is contained. So this is the kind of data, this is... Uh, a little bit gimmicky, I think, but let me see if I can. Whoops. <coughs> so easily. Well, it doesn't tell you an awful lot, but I mean, it's pretty. Um, the uh, so uh, actually, I, I did. I did wonder what this this thing was doing here. That uh, I've not actually looked back at the network, but there was. Uh, uh, there, was a, there was some sort of train crossing in this direction. I don't know what line that is. But this gives you an indication of what the data is like. Imagine this data over a long period of time, over several days, etc. And then you can begin to see uh, some of the things we can do for it. Now, <coughs> Richard, Richard Milton, my colleague, has actually interfaced this data uh, with bus data and also national rail data. These APIs are available for not only for the tubes, basically, but also for the buses. Uh, and the National Rail, and he's produced a map uh, which, again, is not particularly intelligible to you uh, in, any, in any pattern sense, except I guess that if you drilled down to this and looked at it over time, uh, then you would see some uh, system-wide disruptions. But this basically tells you the amount of stuff which is on these various networks, rail, tube, and bus, at this particular point. And these, these, these blue ones uh, are tube stations which... Uh, are showing a weight at the tube station, 15% more than average. And of course, this kind of data is recorded, uh, I don't know whether it's true in Spain, it may be, uh, in terms of our transport systems, this kind of data uh, is recorded and made publicly available all the time. If, for example, uh, a national rail, one of the mainline uh, rail, if, you, if you're actually more than an hour late, uh, then actually you can fill in a form and claim a certain proportion of your fur back, basically. So there's a lot of things in terms of the British system. Because most of this stuff was in the public sector until Mrs. Thatcher, um, when they actually privatised it, they privatised it on certain conditions, and certain of the franchises all depend on actually getting uh, levels of punctuality, levels of accuracy right. So to some extent, it's quite interesting data. So this is a picture of, uh, of Greater London. This is our 8 million... Uh, sort of people basically in Greater London uh, in terms of the actual waiting times in that sense, delays on the buses. Now, um, here for example is, uh, uh, we're doing some work in fact on, on all our projects, particularly this project and also the one related to the Oyster card data. It's my third project I'll move on to in a moment, but uh, we're doing some data um, on the actual flow volumes uh, and the delays during the Olympics. We've got another data set from Transport for London uh, which tells us uh, what happens over the period of the Olympics because uh, I don't know whether this was ever reported here but there, was, uh, there were some forecasts made uh, in central London that central London during the Olympics would, uh, would go to gridlock basically. Everything would be gridlocked uh, because as you can see this is a typical, uh, this is a typical weekday uh, so you have the, the morning peak and the evening peak. So this is a day uh, in this particular context. This is the 14 days of the Olympics. Uh, and you can see that this is a Monday, clearly. These are the two weekend days. Uh, so this is a Monday with the morning and evening peak uh, in this particular context. Uh, and um, what they were beginning to say was that uh, they advised lots of people to 
uh, work from home during the Olympics because of these extra travellers. Uh, and in some senses, um, th there, was, uh, th there was going to be this gridlock, basically. What actually happened was exactly the opposite. It was uh, during the two weeks of the Olympics, it was actually a pleasure to travel on the tube it was, uh, uh, and to walk around London. London was empty, confounding all the predictions that uh, the Olympic Games would lead to massive amounts of people going to fancy shops and this sort of thing. Didn't happen. <laughs> Another ratchet on the economy. So the International Monetary Fund said we're now minus 0.4% you know, uh, uh, GDP this year, uh, rather than minus 0.3%. Same thing, same thing's happening here and Greece and everywhere. So, anyway, notwithstanding all of this, that there were, there were a lot of forecasts were confounded by the Olympics. So we're really looking in more detail at what's actually happened. People stayed away, uh, and enough people stayed away, <coughs> but also, um, also uh, in a sense, the uh, the system was able to cope really with the additional travellers who were the people who visited to the Olympic Games itself. That was clear. Now, interestingly enough, this data set, uh, which in many senses is much more flaky, it tells you less than our Ostercard data set, is very useful during the Olympic Games. It's been very useful for the looking at the Olympic Games because the Ostercard data set, although Transport for London gave us the Ostercard data set during this period, it's not as useful as we thought it would be for the simple reason that the visitors to the Games were given a free Ostercard which was not part of the data set that was recorded by Transport for London. So if you'd got a ticket to the Olympic Games, you were given a free Oyster card in the pack to move around the system, uh, relatively cheap, I suspect, relative to the cost of the tickets and so on, uh, and essentially that was not picked up by the system. Or at least uh, Transport for London decided, well, in the, either in their wisdom or they forgot to actually record this data set. So this is a very useful data set because this is the actual number of tubes. And what Richard has discovered already is that Transport for London claim that they actually ran a lot more tube trains during the actual Olympics. This is the number of tubes, in a sense, uh, going through, and it looks pretty constant. It really, they were saying the weekend they increased the tube trains massively during the Olympic weekends, but it really doesn't look a fat lot different from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, fr from the normal context and that's said, you know, the peaks obviously aren't there in a sense in terms of the trains because it's not a working day. Anyway, this, this is the, sorry? Oh. Uh, this is the number of people or number of trains? Oh, this is the number of trains, not number of people. Okay, so, well, might have been more packed. Yeah, well, <laughs> can't get much more packed than what it is, but no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. So, you know, it swings and roundabouts. To some extent, what we'd like is this data being matched to the Oyster card data because, of course, the Oyster card data, we've not done any work on the Oyster card data trying to associate uh, a person swiping in and a person swiping out with the number of trains. Somebody swipes in on one side of the system and comes out at the other, maybe, you know, 45 minutes later, 50 minutes. We don't know what lines they've travelled on. That's the point. They may have transferred several times. Uh, and that's another detective job that we can do on the data set by looking at shortest routes and things of that sort. Now, I'm going to stop at that point. Uh, actually, the, uh, uh, this is another thing from Richard. I'll just point this out, which is quite interesting. This is the effect of a bus strike on the, uh, on the 22nd of, uh, of May 2012. Uh, and this is the location of buses and you can see that the bus company in question obviously operated in East London at that point. Uh, and this is the following day at 9 o'clock. Uh, and you can actually see quite a difference. So again, from this data, uh, you can begin to look at patterns of disruption. Of course, this is all in hindsight, etc., uh, in a sense. But we, do, uh, we can actually identify the buses in question uh, because it's a certain bus company, basically, that went on strike uh, at this particular point. So again, this is... This is typical of the kind of thing that you can begin to uh, glean from this data. Okay, problem two. A little bit of um, uh, simple algebra about graphs at this point. Problem two is looking at the networks, uh, which looking at the networks which uh, represent, in this case, the tube system. Now, the tube system uh, I'm going to be talking about is just the, just the tube, not the overground, not the buses, not the walking, which we'll come on to in terms of problem three. But this is actually very typical, I think, of the sort of thing that is being thrown up by network science. It's almost a preliminary approach to ideas of disruption. Now, 
there, there are some, a couple of things here that uh, really relate to characterizing the network itself. There are three things here. One, the most obvious one is the degree of the graph, which is essentially uh, the number of uh, links uh, which enter or exit any particular node. Now, we're making the very st st strong assumption, but one that is generally pretty plausible, that the network is symmetric in this particular context. And if you can go from one tube station to another, you can come back again. That is not completely accurate in terms of one or two instances. At Heathrow, for example, it's not symmetric. You're down around in a little bit of a loop there, uh, in a sense. And if you want to go to Terminal 5, it's a bit tricky. Uh, but nonetheless, generally speaking, we've made the assumption uh, that uh, the in degrees and the out degrees, which are the, uh, the number of uh, segments or links coming into a hub or a node, uh, is the same as those going out, in a sense. So this is really like a conservation in that sense. Now, there are two measures. This is a measure, to some extent, of immediate centrality, local centrality. Uh, we'll see in a moment when we look at the table that there are only two uh, tube stra stations in the system with more than uh, seven degrees uh, of centrality in that sense, meaning there are seven different links to other lines, basically, in a sense. So that's the maximum. Uh, the between the centrality and the closeness centrality are measures of both local and global centrality. That the, uh, the between the centrality is a measure uh, which is really like a weighted measure of the number of shortest paths which, which, which go through a station K, for example, from all other stations in the network over I and J. So these are all the links between I and J which are shortest paths, they have to be shortest paths, which go through a particular station K. Uh, and in this particular context, uh, obviously something that is physically towards the center of the system is going to have a lot more shortest paths going through it from all other um, nodes in the system than something which is on the edge of the system. So this is a reasonable measure of centrality. It's one which is widely used in the social networks and in the, uh, uh, in the, in the network science literature. This is a measure of closeness centrality where we're actually using a measure of distance between I and J. Uh, so this could be Euclidean distance or it could indeed be unit distance if one segment is counted as, uh, uh, as, a, as a unit link in this particular context. But nevertheless, it's a measure, these are both measures of what in our world, uh, the world of cities basically, we call accessibility. Um, they're called centrality in the, in the network science literature. Now here, here oh, and, and uh, let me just go on to say that the equivalent uh, measures, to some extent, can be seen in terms of flows. If we think of these as links on the network, then of course we can, we can actually produce, if we have flows on the networks associated with the links, then all of these measures can be thought of as flows. And uh, really the, uh, the simple uh, indices for the third problem, the Ostercard problem, where we do have flows uh, in this context is uh, TIJ is now uh, not a link between I and J, it's actually a flow in this context, so we have uh, the same sort of accounting here. Um, and uh, one particular issue in the third problem I'll talk about, the, uh, what happens when we close a tube station to the flow volumes in that sense, is that the, the flows are conserved, basically. We assume that all of the passengers are rerouted somewhere else, that they go in search of the nearest tube station to resume their journey in this particular context. Certain assumptions are made about uh, what happens if they're uh, if they don't need to get to the next tube station, they go to the next tube station anyway, the tube station before closes in that sense, then here you have to account for that. But in general terms, uh, we, we assume that no passengers are lost in the system. Uh, so we can make comparisons between the flows before a disruption and flows after a disruption uh, in adjacent stations. Uh, and we have um, measures of weighted betweenness uh, and uh, weighted uh, uh, closeness, basically, but uh, in this context, we've really looked at weighted between us, where we simply weight the shortest paths by the number of flows which, uh, which are associated with that path. Okay, now here's our preliminary analysis. These are these measures graphed for the London tube system. Now, this is a, a slimmed down version of the tube map, basically. It's taken from uh, Wikipedia, basically, this map, uh, essentially, but... Um, and it doesn't include, I think, the 
It only includes a portion of the Docklands Light Rail. It's not been, uh, uh, it's not been updated. So it's not a, uh, a complete map. It's not as complete as the one we'll look at in a moment. But these are the degrees, basically. Uh, so these are the, the strength of the hubs in terms of the closeness. And you can see the classics. So you can see clearly here the, the, the tree-like structure, basically, in this big clustering of, uh, uh, of lines, etc., in the center. Uh, this, I think, is the between the centrality uh, and this is the closeness centrality. These are the two measures. Uh, there are quite high correlations between these three graphs in this particular context, but we'd argue that probably the between the centrality, uh, which really shows the number of shortest routes going between each of these stations, is, in, uh, is, is perhaps the most important of these, these three measures. Again, it's arguable because there are, there are other possibilities as well. Okay, now let's have a look at these measures in terms of the stations themselves. Uh, and these are the top ten for uh, the hubs. So, for example, Baker Street and King's Cross, uh, which are both on the circle line, basically. King's Cross, of course, is a big mainline station as well. Baker Street and King's Cross have access to seven different lines coming through them uh, in this particular context. So the degree is seven. Bank has access to six, and of course, etc. Green Park's important. I'll come back to that in a moment uh, with six, and so on, all the way down to... Uh, that, the, the vast majority of these things are, simply have one degree that you, could, you get into a subway station, you can only move on to the next one, basically, in this particular context. Um, the, um, uh, the closeness the, between the centrality, which you see, uh, and the closeness centrality, this gives you the number of shortest paths. So Green Park, which is a very interesting station because uh, um, it's adjacent to Green Park, uh, is... Uh, uh, connected to six different lines. Actually, it's connected to it's connected to three different lines. You really should uh, actually. I, sh I, I should uh, I should get this right. You can connect to to a line going in either direction, basically. It's uh, connected to three lines. Green Park, for example, has the Jubilee line, the uh, Piccadilly line, and the uh, uh, Victoria line all going through, basically. But this has the greatest number of shortest routes going through it, in a sense. Uh, and what we'll show in a moment, we're going to close Green Park and we're going to close Liverpool Street and look at the impact uh, on, the, uh, on, the close, on, the, on the centrality, basically, of doing that. So again, uh, in the top 10 and indeed in the top 20, there's quite a strong correlation between each of these measures. But we'd argue that the, uh, the, uh, the non-local the, the non measure, basically, the, the local global measures, uh, are, are considerably more useful in terms of looking at the impact. Okay, now this is the, this is the impact of closing uh, Liverpool Street, um, and uh, Liverpool Street is obviously closed. This is the, the plus and the minus uh, in terms of uh, uh, between the centrality. So Liverpool Street is somewhere uh, in the system here. Uh, this, I think, is Bank Station. So Liverpool Street, Liverpool Street may well be that station where I'm just pointing to. But the, the impact is greater on the east. But one of the interesting features of simply doing this is that Liverpool Street, we were surprised by how little impact it was having on the rest of the system. Bank is only one stop away from Liverpool Street, in a sense. Uh, there's, a, there's an impact on Bank, but there's really very little impact west. What we're actually saying, in fact, is that uh, there's lots of other ways in which people can get west. Quite complicated, but not many ways, really, where people can get east in this context. So it's physical position relative to the other stations in the network is less critical in this particular context uh, than uh, indeed uh, stations to the west. So that's the situation for Liverpool. Now, of course, we can do this ad nauseum. We can do it time and time again. This, in fact, is the impact of closing Green Park, which had the greatest uh, between centrality. You can see the repercussions all the way around the circle line, in a sense. These are... Uh, these are, are probably increased flows, and these are decreased flows. The black uh, is the decreased, I think, and these are the increased. Uh, some slightly counterintuitive examples uh, in the sense that the diffusion is not spread out completely in that sense. It depends on the local configurations, I think. But interestingly enough, this particular station is clearly a lot more critical than Liverpool Street, which is over here in that sense. And it's quite interesting that... Um, if you read any of the spy novels about MI6 and MI5, Green Park is quite close to those sorts of stations, those sorts of areas. It's, it's not far away from Buckingham Palace and uh, 
Westminster and that sort of thing, St. James and so on, the Cabinet Office and so on. So um, people are quite amused by the fact that Green Park is the most vulnerable station uh, in the system. So if Al-Qaeda want to do their job, then go to Green Park, basically. So um, actually, believe it or not, I did talk to somebody who actually sort of in government who actually thought this was a very revealing finding. I mean... <laughs> Not convinced myself, but okay. Now let's move on to problem three. Problem three is probably uh, the most interesting because it gets back to this Oyster card data set. Now I did say earlier on that um, one of the features about uh, looking at the impact of closing tube stations uh, in this Oyster card data set, where the flows are actually disrupted as well as the actual geometry of the network, the topology of the network, is that in this case we're much more interested in the local problem of where people divert to, actually outside of the tube station. So we're also very interested in how long it takes to actually enter the tube station. So this, in fact, is a, a complicated tube station. If you go to Bank and Monument, if you go down to Bank, which is Bank of England area, uh, you can walk all the way through to Monument and to the Docklands Light Railway. Uh, and this really is a very complicated station. I mean, this is true of many, many subway stations, I think, around the world that you get this kind of complexity that really needs to be added in. So if Bank Station closed, for example, and you had to get to the Docklands Light Railway, you would probably come off over here, and you might actually find, if you walked along the local, uh, local street, it might actually be better than going to Bank anyway, basically. It's well known that uh, Mansion House, which is down here somewhere, uh, if you use the, the so-called idealized Beck tube map, and you want to go from bank to mansion house, uh, then basically you would, you would go th through about 10 stations out of your way, because if you just walked out of the mansion house, you can see bank across the road. There's a station saying bank, basically. Same in Hammersmith, right? Okay, Hammersmith, the two stations in Hammersmith are just across the road from each other, but if you looked at the tube maps, uh, then they would, they would look quite different in that sense. Uh, so in other words, what we're really saying is the local geometry makes a difference. And in this project, we've built in the local geometry. So we're back really to, let me just go very quickly back to the, uh, uh, the original map here. Uh, what we're talking about here is the, is the full network, basically. Um, and John Reeds, who's done this, has also coded uh, the distances to actually walk uh, from one tube station to another um, as long as they're less than, and I've got this, go, let's go back to the slides at this point. Um, he tells us somewhere uh, at the beginning that, um, uh, okay, he builds a walking network between all stations that within five kilometers of each other. Now, that's a long way to walk, five kilometers, if your station closes, basically. Long way to walk. Um, obviously, he's built this with... Uh, uh, a view to adding in the bus system ultimately, uh, but there are some examples where you could, where if you wanted to go on, on the on the tree map, if you wanted to go from one end of the tree to the other, basically, and something closed in the middle, uh, then probably the fastest way to do it, other than going all the way around the network and back again, would be to actually walk. So the reason why he's built in this very large tolerance, this five-kilometer tolerance, is to build the walking network. Essentially. Um, he's built a walk network which almost sort of uh, sits on the open street map, uh, uh, which, um, uh, which essentially is almost the open street map itself in that context. Okay, uh, let me go on to say, say what he does. He does a number of things very similar to what I was doing with the topology. Um, uh, here he's closed two stations, Rainers Lane and Stratford, which are, t are two extremes in the system, and I'll show you. Uh, a map in a moment that actually shows what happens to the passengers. Um, basically, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the difference when uh, the system is disrupted, uh, and this is the normal AM peak. He's obviously chosen uh, the AM peak in this particular context, uh, and these are the changes. The green, I think, probably pertain to uh, the green pertain to walking, uh, and the, uh, the the blue pertain to travel. Uh, and these are the actual shifts, basically, in this particular context. So if everything were the same, if there was no disruption, then these things would appear on a straight line. It's simply one way of representing it. Uh, and he does the same for Liverpool Street and Victoria. These are two ends of the system, east and west in London. Uh, these are two mainline stations, 
uh, which again are fairly extreme. They're probably the biggest distance between any two stations in the centre, any two main mainline stations, main national rail stations would be Liverpool Street <coughs> and indeed Victoria um, on the southwest, that's northeast and southwest. Okay, so this is his uh, <coughs> um, this is his basic map of the tube system uh, in this particular context. Now, this is the undisturbed network. Um, uh, not so easy to read in terms of this slide, but um, <coughs> Uh, if you drill down a bit, you could actually pick up quite a lot of detail from this map. But again, it's characteristic of what we've been saying all along. We've got this tree structure. Uh, these are directed links at this point. Um, and because uh, there's a little bit more uh, detail embodied in this characterization of the problem, I think he has looked at directed links rather than symmetric links. Uh, and this is the complexity in the middle around the circle line that, uh, that we showed. Um, okay, so. Uh, let me see if I can interpret this. Uh, essentially, uh, this is Liverpool Street and Victoria. Liverpool Street and Victoria are uh, those purple uh, or mauve um, uh, stations here. So those are mainline stations and um, Liverpool Street and Victoria are both on the circle line, basically, in this particular point. Uh, and we showed the example of Liverpool Street earlier on. Uh, what's happened in, um, in, in this particular instance, he's closed Liverpool Street and he's closed Victoria. And these are the actual flows on the network. Quite difficult to represent visually uh, in some senses, but you can actually see the disruption to the flow uh, in, some, in, in, in a particular context rather than a disruption to the link. What I was showing was the accessibility of the particular node relative to all these links. He's actually showing the pluses or the minuses from the flow. Now, I can't I can't uh, tell you exactly uh, where the pluses and minuses are in this particular context. I should also say that the green bit, the green bits represent uh, uh, the number of people who come out of a tube station and walk to an adjacent st station in this particular context. So the purple represent flows on the actual subway, so the tube system, uh, and or the, the overground in that sense. The, the green represent uh, movements that were on the tube system before the station, station was closed and then are diverted onto the, onto the street system to walk to, it, to an adjacent tube in this particular context. Okay, let me move on to Rainers Lane in Stratford. Uh, and you can see that uh, Rainers Lane is out here. This is on the uh, Heathrow is down here, basically. So if you're on your way to Oxford, for example, from Central London, you go quite near Rainers Lane. You go on the A40 to Oxford, so you go near Rainers Lane. So this is closing this particular context, uh, and this is closing Stratford, which is the Olympic Games site, and uh, I guess he's got uh, things uh, in this particular context here. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, there are some repercussions uh, along the central line here uh, in this particular context. And one of the interesting features, which uh, I don't think we show this here, one of the interesting features is to close a station in the middle around here uh, and to watch how people uh, making a, a journey in this sort of direction uh, begin to actually use the walking system uh, across here in that sense. So that's the kind of thing uh, that we're able to do with this sort of data. Lots and lots of uh, potential really for beginning to uh, develop a more coherent, more coherent that is than uh, what I've been explaining so far, a more coherent view of how we could begin to measure disruption in a systematic sense. And of course, I've only shown two examples here, uh, two mainline stations closing and Rainer's Lane. But the implication of all this is that uh, uh, even in a system as relatively simple topologically uh, as a tree system of this kind, the disruptions can be quite counterintuitive in some senses. And certainly once we move to other modes, and in this context the walking mode, uh, then you can get some quite interesting sort of uh, deviations. Okay, and um, again, uh, this is betweenness and closeness for Liverpool Street. So John is actually re reworking the measures we used uh, using the flow stuff. Uh, and I don't think these are uh, that easy to interpret. He's actually correlating closeness, centrality, and betweenness in that sense. Uh, so there's a fairly low correlation in, in some senses. Okay, let me kind of uh, round it off because I'm going for about uh, 50 minutes or so. And let me say... Uh, what we might begin to do with all of this data. 
Um, what we're very interested in doing is identifying a way of uh, dealing with uh, classifying disruptions into different types. Uh, the disruptions we've talked about are mainly through closing nodes in the network, but we can close lines. One of the features um, of the data uh, is that we know, we know where people enter uh, and exit. We don't know what lines they're traveling on, uh, but we can make plausible scenarios by actually working out the shortest route, assuming they follow the shortest route, and that's not by any means certain. There's a lot of variation in that sense, we think. Uh, but nevertheless, we can make a plausible estimate of what lines they would use. What we're very interested in is closing individual lines. The London Tube has been privatized in a very strange way, that the lines themselves are all different in the sense that the central line is operated by a different company from the Victoria line, different company from the Jubilee line, and so on. And um, this means that you can actually get a strike on the central line. Uh, so the central line might be down. Uh, a strike these days in Britain does not mean like a strike in the 1970s where everything went down because, you know, only 30% of the drivers don't turn up for work. But it's enough to actually wreck the system a bit. When you're getting diversions, etc. Uh, and so in some senses, we'd like to answer the question, what happens if a line goes down? Uh, and of course, that might be not, not a strike, but it may be uh, a, a, a stalled train or something. Uh, and then a whole range of different things relating to stations. Uh, what happens in central London is that occasionally a train will not stop at a station during peak hour. You'll be on the central line heading from Holborn to Tottenham Court Road and the, and the driver will say, we're not stopping at Tottenham Court Road because of overcrowding, basically. If you go to Tottenham Court Road station, you know, the porters are holding the crowds back, basically. It almost sounds like Tokyo, right? So do it on Tokyo, it'd be fantastic. I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right, yeah, okay. Um, anyway, so we'd like, to do, we'd like to develop a much more coherent view about framing what-if scenarios in this particular context. We'd like to know a little bit more about route choice preferences. That's a big area um, to do with wayfinding and cognition on something like a tube system. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't really know what the tube system looks like um, on the ground. In other words, uh, going back to this graph here of the tube system, uh, a lot of people don't recognize the tube. They only know the kind of idealized tube map uh, in this particular context. Um, and that actually, uh, that is quite counter counterintuitive in terms of the way people travel. Until I lived in London, I went to London lots of times, I only really knew the tube map. And it was a surprise to me when you come out of a subway station and you see something that on the tube map looks as though it's a million miles away, but it's just across the road when you come out at ground level. So that's kind of, that's kind of quite a big issue we really want to look at as well. And it's related to the shortest route problem um, in this particular context. Okay, a couple of other things we want to do. We'd like to, um, we'd like to obviously integrate all of this with the bus system. That's a big problem in some senses. Uh, and we want to actually begin to model the walk patterns inside of complicated stations. I showed you an example of uh, Bank and uh, Monument where you've got these long platforms where the Docklands Light Railway comes in and all this sort of stuff. Uh, we'd like to actually model those times in more detail. We've got them built in as just values in a sense, but there are choices to be made even within these tube stations in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, and finally we'd like to look at trying to incorporate the national rail system flows uh, because this I think might make a big difference. This is the fact that a lot of commuters into central London certainly are using the national rail system and then they're getting onto either the overground or the underground or the bus system or they're walking uh, and so these complicated multimodal trips basically uh, we really need to move towards those. And, and once we've begun to tackle that, we think we'll have a, a much better sense of um, uh, uh, making sense of the disruptions on networks like this. Because at the moment, all we're actually showing is possible ways of actually thinking about disruption. We don't necessarily have any strong confidence in what we're producing is what would actually happen in that sense. We need to have 
much greater level of realism, I think, built into the data set. And in some sense, this is not modeling per se. The shortest route, it's, it's really a, a kind of an elaborate sort of accounting exercise as to how to move the numbers around that characterize this particular system. So I'd like to stop at that point. Here's our coordinates. Um, there's a website there that contains a little bit of this sort of stuff and um, uh, some, um, uh, uh, some acknowledgments to our sources of funding. Thank you very much. Yeah. And there's a lot more things which go beyond topology, which are yeah. not only about the capacity of the line, but also the yeah. frequency of the line. Yeah, yeah. Change things. What about temporal uh, and temporal aspects, for example? A uh, number of stations might not at all determine how long, for example, the trip from one node to the other takes. So some lines are a lot slower than others. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And also, the, the modern media, where I, for example, have the possibility now to have information a lot uh, earlier. And for example, react also earlier in order to, for example, avoid disruptions of yep. the station. Yep. How far uh, can a topological approach tackle that already appropriately, or what would need to be done in order to get really? Because I think yeah. in the end, one needs something like a traffic guidance system. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think on the top, the topological example is really <coughs> the simplest first pass at the system because the topology. The topological approach, the topology of the tube network does not even include, um, in terms of what I was showing, um, physical distance. So uh, the link between two stations is simply coded as a unit weight in, 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 in these terms. So the first thing would probably be to weight the network in a sense. Now, that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Um, I expect one could begin to react to what you're saying by weighting the network differently. Typically in transportation modeling, um, uh, distance was thrown away a long time ago and they talk about travel, travel time or rather generalized travel cost which takes account of parking at both ends and you know tolls, bridges, all kinds of stuff. And the same could be done here in that sense. I'm not sure that it would address some of the things you're getting at that um, just as those models don't address it for uh, road systems, etc. Um, the notion about um, speed of trains, for example, and the relationship between speed of trains and capacity, uh, a lot of stuff happens on certain lines because they can't close the doors uh, because people are leaning against them. Apparently, it's, it's always extremely counterintuitive to me to be on a packed tube train and the driver says, for God's sake, get off the doors, right? <laughs> the passenger don't lean against the doors. You're crowded like this. And you can't not lean against the door, right? So, but the doors won't close because of safety things. So basically, that can, on certain lines, like the central line, for example, that can actually delay trains quite massively in that sense. Um, so that sort of interaction between capacity and time is something that needs to be thought about a bit. Um, also, the, the fact that uh, what this doesn't take account of is what's happening on different lines. So if you're on one line um, and another line is slowed and there's an interchange up, uh, ahead of you in some senses, there are repercussions down the lines. Now, strictly speaking, the accessibility measures should, to some extent, take that into account. Um, but the, the things all we've been doing is closing a, a station. What we're talking about here is where you get a repercussion through the network uh, due to what's happening on these different lines. Now, we've not looked at that at all. You'd need to build in, um, you, you'd need to look at an index that somehow uh, took that real-time kind of change into account, really. So, so the topological approach, I think, all it gives you is, at the moment, is some sense that some stations are less accessible than others uh, and might have more impact than others uh, if, if they were to close. Um, and in certain relatively complex situations, that might be quite useful. 
Um, it, it struck me in terms of the Green Park example. I didn't expect Green Park to come out like that. Um, and I think that when I went back and I looked, I wasn't particularly aware of Green Park. I don't normally go through it. But when you actually look at it, it does look, as a, it does look like a critical point in the network. There's no question about that. Given the fact that it's on these quite on these more modern lines, like the Victoria Line and the Jubilee Line, the more recent lines, they were built in the 20th century, right, basically, or late 20th. And um, so in some senses, I think it gives you that kind of handle. But I don't address, I mean, the th things you're raising, I think, are things we're very conscious of, and we can do a limited amount of things with them, in some sense. Um, but nevertheless, they're important issues. Yes, yeah, I want to ask uh, I'm more or less following the same, the same uh, question. It's uh, out of the data, so uh, since you have different access to people from one institution to the other, but uh, you have to assume how they go from one place to the other, too. Uh, is there any way to actually measure <coughs> the number of people that is connecting from one line to the other in every station? Because that would be a centrality measure. Yeah. And, and then just uh, a little bit of uh, that. Uh, I, what, I, what you have said is that most of the, of the lines are, are working in an autonomous way, more or less, not even by different companies and so on. Have you seen any, uh, for instance, if you have delays in one of the lines, this can communicate to other lines? Or yeah, I, th I think that. Um I think that uh, I think we need I think probably need to qualify this that the, the companies themselves are autonomous, but the actual operation of the system on a day-to-day -day basis is not autonomous. It's highly controlled, and again, that actually I think relates to the fact that the operation of the of the network. We have this thing in Britain um, with privatisation of trains, where the network is is owned by a different company from the people who own the rolling stock and the workers who drive the trains, the different, different again. And um, the network and the operation of it are controlled centrally, no question about it. So the second point is l less significant. Your first point, can you, what was your yeah, first, it was quite. It was quite about, uh, you were able to extract from the real data, the, the fluxes. Yeah. Um, this is quite problematic um, in the sense that the way we've approached it so far, um, and we've not, actually the way the way we're thinking of approaching it we've not actually in, in in the stuff we've done so far we've not we have the we have the line data of course but uh, we've not associated passengers with lines um, we have actually we can do that but we've not extracted the data from it it's it's been computed because basically when a passenger goes from point a to point b uh, we work out the shortest route across any of these lines of course and we choose the one that is the shortest. So we know, uh, at least in terms of the calculation, what lines they're using. What we've not done is to add up the um, amount of interchange at any particular. From that, we could, we've got all the passengers and what lines they use. We can then add up, at any particular station, how many people are transferring from one line to the other. So we can produce a, a matrix of those flows. We've not done that. and. My feeling is that that's the next stage we should do because we can actually look at that data and see whether it's plausible. That's the first point. It might be that, you know, if half the people are shifting from the central line to the circle line and then shifting again back to the central line two stations on because of this calculation, we would know that that's wrong, basically. And that can happen in these things, you know. Because, you know, you look at these lines and they're intersecting every three or four stations with another line in the center. That's exactly what we need to do, basically. Um, the, the big issue is, can we get data on the transfer? Um, I think Transport for London have this data, but it's often produced by one-off surveys, right, in that sense. So we might get some, pl we probably there is data get, getting some plausibility of what the relative rates of transfer are. So we could then match that against what our shortest route thing was showing. Yeah, because I mean, when you are the shortest, you are looking at the quality of the shortest, but uh, there can be also the question of timing, or the question that yeah. you would prefer to stay in the same line. And, and the, other, the, the other thing that, uh, that you both mentioned, I think, was this question about um, in the information technology that is transmitted to the passenger. Um, and uh, we, of various sorts, that, that normally, the drivers on the trains will tell you if something's happening. And uh, 
the big issue is dependent on where you're going and how much, ex how much experience you have of the, of the tube system. If I'm sitting at Holborn going one stop to Tottenham Court Road and the train stops and the bloke says, oh, there's 10 trains in front of us, right? You know, they're backed up all the way. And they wait for a bit, the doors are open. You think, should I get off and walk? Or should I wait, right? It's this kind of, and you can, you look around the passenger and everybody else is think, you know, thinking, should I get off and walk? <laughs> so, yeah, and this one, and so um, that's a big issue. And that, that's to do with information. And there's getting, you're getting more information on the tube trains these days, on the digital displays and so on, um, you know, you look at the digital display and uh, if in a station which has a digital display which normally works, if the digital display isn't working, then I think you'd best leave the station, right? Because the operators have switched it off. They don't want to tell the passengers that there aren't any trains for the next half hour. So, but some, di so, some stuff out on the edge of the trees, the digital displays don't work because oh, they just don't bother, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of kind of folklore which is built into people's behavior in this sense. It's a very interesting question, trying to systematize it, what, how much you can systematize and build into these things. More questions or commentary? Do you factor in cost at all? Sorry? Um, at the moment, c cost is not factored in. Um, the easiest way to factor it in is probably to um, work out time cost, basically, the cost of time, basically, in a sense. So our shortest routes, uh, they're probably based on Euclidean distance at the moment, Euclidean distance between the segments, but they should probably be based on some kind of travel cost. But it's not, it's not out of the pocket cost because the, the, the system is divided into zones. That's another interesting issue, actually, about cost. You know, some passengers probably get off, you know, before the zone changes, right? If you check go from zone one to zone two, it'll cost you, with an Oyster card, £1.50 off your Oyster card if you're in zone one. If you go one stop more to zone two, it'll cost you £2.50. And I bet there are people who've worked this out. If you, li if you work just in zone two, um, uh, the next station along. Often they organize these lines so that that distance uh, walking across the road is the longest, right? So the Liverpool Street is classic. <laughs> Liverpool Street is in zone one. Oldgate's in zone one. But if you want to go to the Royal London Hospital, which is in Whitechapel, which is the next station on, it's quite a long walk, right? You know, so I don't know whether there's a bit of co-evolution or, uh, uh, you know, counter. There's a bit of a kind of game theory going on between people who fix the fares and but the cost is very important I agree um, but, uh, uh, but actual out-of-pocket costs for the actual card itself is quite tricky to know how to factor in um, largely because the system is very simple in terms of that kind of it's more the cost of time really it's these intangibles in that sense and then more like say if the fares change during the time of the yeah. to produce then um, Yes, the fares, because the fares change, the fares are changing all the time with inflation, etc. And they're ratcheted up um, in, a, in, a, in certain indivisible units, like 50p at a time or 25p, that sort of thing. Um, uh, I don't know what the answer to that would be, but there certainly would be an impact, there's no question. Yeah, the, if, if you had differential cost, a big differential shift between zones 1 and 2, in terms of cost, it would make an impact. Very difficult to figure that out. We'd be, we'd, very, we'd be very interested in getting data on both sides of that divide, right? To some extent, that was what the Olympics was about, that we knew something big was going to happen, uh, and therefore we had the data over the whole period, before and after and during. The same with a, same with a large fair rise. It would be very interesting to look at the Oyster Guard data to see how people had changed. And what you could do, typically, is because you have a unique identifier, um, you could work out those people who, th those individuals who did actually shift their, their in and out at that point. In, in these big data sets with millions of records, you could do that basically. Um, so it'd be very, yeah, it's a big issue.
Thank you very much again. Okay.